name is Leslie Bell and I am the research navigator at the Sector Success Center. So I know a lot of you through different hats that I wear and have met or talked with most of you before. But for those of you who don't know me, um, if you ever have any questions about the Success Center and the services that we offer and the things that we do, I have left a few cards and I have more with me on this front table. So feel free to grab a card and call us anytime you have a question about research or if there's anything that we can do for you. But today, I am really excited that we get to kind of walk you through this new institutional policy we've developed on getting um, EMR access for our research monitors or our sponsor auditors when they come to campus. Just to kind of give the background to everybody, we know that there are many different roles um, of people that come to campus looking for EMR access. And this definitely does not fill every single role. We have specifically only focused for now on research monitors for when they come and sponsor auditors. So FDA audits are different, insurance audits are different, needing um, a net ID for REDCap or EIRB is different. So this policy is specifically for research monitors and sponsor auditors. So just keeping that in mind going forward if any questions should come up, but if you have any questions regarding different people coming to campus and wanting to know what that process is, feel free to give me a call, and if I don't know, I'll try and point you in the right direction regarding that as well. So just to give you a little bit of background about why we needed a new policy. So we started to have some coordinators call us and say, we're trying to do trials, we have monitors coming to campus, but we can't get them a net ID to get into the EMR because they don't want to give us their social security number. Or we can't get them a net ID because their company won't let us do an additional background check on this monitor. Um, so we realized that there were some issues and it was presenting challenges and barriers to doing research on campus. So our big goal was to overcome those issues. And in doing the research on how different departments and um, offices went about getting their, their monitors net IDs or EMR access, it was different in every department. So every department I talked to had a different workflow, contacted different people, um, and so we decided that was a problem in itself and there needed to be one workflow, so that was an I the idea we started out with. The other issue that we were coming across was that when sponsors came to do site initiation visits or monitors arrived to campus for the first time, they were a little worried about the fact that they had access to our entire EMR once they got a net ID. They didn't want to be able to see or accidentally stumble upon any patients. They only wanted to see the patients that they were supposed to have access to that had signed a HIPAA um, for the study that they were enrolled on. And although we do audits after the fact um, to see where those monitors have gone and make sure that they didn't enter inappropriate charts, these monitors and sponsors wanted to make sure that there was a preventative measure in place that that wouldn't be able to happen, right? And that they couldn't just accidentally open a chart that they weren't supposed to. So that brought us to um, developing this new process. So the form, before I start, I'll say that the new the entire policy that was developed and all the new forms that are associated with it are available on HR's website. So if you go to University HR, it's right on their homepage right now under um, News and Events. It'll say New EMR Access Policy. It's a single PDF document that contains the entire policy and also later in that document all of the associated forms with that policy, which will include the Net ID request form, the monitor sponsor auditor um, agreement that they have to submit to get the net ID, screenshots for the coordinator for how to uh, create and share patient lists in Epic, screenshots for the monitor and how to view the patient list. So we're going to go through these forms today, but all of them are available in this one PDF document on the HR page. So. I'm going to walk us through each of the steps involved in the process first. I'm also going to do a demo for you a little bit later on with how to create and share the patient list in Epic. So the first step is that upon notification that a research monitor will be visiting campus, you want to verify whether or not that monitor has a net ID. And if they have a net ID, is it still active? Or has it been canceled by HR or are their account suspended because their sponsorship is over? So Hopefully the monitor will know that 
right? Do you have an idea? Have you been to MUSC before? When was the last time you used it? Was it associated with this study? So that way we can try and um, hopefully predict whether or not it's still active. We can always contact HR if they're not sure if it's still active, give them the monitor's name and their current net ID. If it's not active, we will have to notify HR and they'll just reset the password. Um, if, it is, if they've never had a net ID before, that's when the whole net ID request process starts. So originally when we developed this policy, we said this is going to be from here on out going forward, people who apply for a net ID. We're not going to necessarily try and find everybody who's had a net ID before this and, you know, change their net ID or, or change their title um, because we thought it would be kind of this overwhelming burden. Uh, but we recently attempted it with Hollings. They had a lot of monitors. They said, we really want to use this restricted template. We want to make sure that our monitors now have restricted access to patients as soon as possible. And we were able to send Courtney Cullum at HR a list of their monitors and net IDs. And she was able to change all of their titles to the new research monitor title, which I'll go over in a second. Um, and then we also sent it to Epic and they were able to change all of their templates to the restricted template. So if you do have current monitors that have net IDs and currently have access to all of Epic, you can send the, a list of the monitors and their net IDs to Courtney Cullum at University HR as well as William Cooney at Epic and say I would like these monitors changed to the new research monitor title and template and they can get that happening for you. So if they don't have one, I'm going to show you the external research monitor sponsor auditor agreement form in one second, but it looks a lot like the old NetID request forms that we were using to some extent. It does not ask for social security number anymore, which is great. It does not require the background check anymore, which was great. Um, and the reason being, A, because they're, the monitor is now and has been in the past also covered contractually through the clinical trial agreement with the university. So their sponsor is essentially taking responsibility for them anyway and that they've done appropriate um, checks on this individual and employee. But we've also now restricted them to what they have access to with a NetID. They really can only get into web apps with their NetID and once they're in web apps they can only access the EPIC restricted template. So their net ID really doesn't give them any power anymore to get anywhere else on campus but this one specific place. Um, their, their specific net ID, which has a research monitor title, does not allow them to VPN from off campus. Which, so that's another reason why it really limits their um, access and increases our security. So in the future, we know remote uh, monitoring is a possibility. This system that we're using in this restricted template does have the ability to be remoted into and to use remote access, but we are not going to let that happen now. We're restricting their net IDs to no VPN, which means they can't do it off campus, because that's really a policy that needs to be worked through. Extra steps need to be added, training needs to be added, additional securities need to be put in place. So we're going to kind of cross that bridge when we come to it and when it becomes something that we have to cross. But for now, we really want to roll this out and make sure it works on our home turf while they're here in front of us so we can really make sure it's as secure and functional as possible. Um, so that's great. The form gets to, we get to take off a lot of those personal identifiers that sponsors were having issues with. Um, so I'll show you the form in a second, but there's a part where the NUSC personnel will complete it who are sponsoring the NetID, whether that be the coordinator on the study or the PI, um, and then there's the part that the research monitor will complete. It'll be signed and sent to um, the HR university specialist, who currently is Courtney Cullum. Uh, Rhonda Richardson can be copied on it if Courtney's out of the office. Um, give HR as much notice as possible. So as soon as you know I have a monitor who might be coming, even if they're not, you don't know the exact dates that they're coming yet, go ahead and get this form complete and send it to HR. The other nice thing about the fact that we no longer have to do the background check on research monitors is that it's not quite as long of a turnaround time as it was before to get a net ID. So although we don't want to um, make Courtney drop everything she's doing and create all these net IDs overnight, 
it also is not going to be quite as long of a turnaround time or a wait as it's been in the past. So give her as much notice, or whoever's uh, processing the form, as much notice as possible, but just know it, it'll happen quicker than it used to. Um, if the net ID request is approved, the MUSC sponsor will be notified, and you can pick up your envelope same way you used to with the net ID for your monitor and their temporary password either at HR over in Harborview or on the fourth floor of the library. Just let um, the HR specialist know where you're going to pick it up. So this, I know it's really small print, you'll see it when you pull it up on the HR website, but this is the agreement itself. A lot of the, um, the statements in here are statements that um, are kind of pulled out from different policies on campus that only have these very specific components that apply to monitors. So before, where we used to also have to have them sign confidentiality agreements and the CO27 policy, now all of the important statements from those policies are in this agreement, so there's no additional paperwork that they have to sign. It's just this agreement. Okay. Um, something I'll point out that a lot of people have asked me about in the presentations I've been doing is the approximate length of commitment. So ideally for your monitors, you're going to put how long you think they're going to be visiting for their study, right? Um, I know that sometimes monitors overlap studies. So one thing you're going to want to do is when that, that monitor ends their commitment to you, you're going to want to make sure before you notify HR that they're not working for you anymore, that they're not in any other studies in your department. Just see if you can check in with people, because you wouldn't want to cancel their net ID or, or end their, their sponsorship for their net ID and still have them on studies somewhere. Um, you can put, even though it says to put the approximate length of commitment, just note they will never give you a net ID that's longer than a year. So at a year, no matter what, they're going to have to reset, uh, somebody at HR is going to have to reset their password. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And that's the way it's been in the past as well. So once you get um, the net ID and temporary password from HR, before your monitor comes to campus, you're going to want to send them some information. You're going to want to send them their net ID and temporary password. And while doing that, you're going to want to tell them that they need to change their password from temporary to a real one that only they know. right? And you're also going to want to tell them they have to set up their Epic account before coming to campus. So in order to do that, this document is also in um, that HR packet. I drafted an email. So literally all you have to do is plug in the monitor's name. And this email tells them all the instructions that they have to do with their net ID. So it tells them first to go to um, the net ID page and change their password from a temporary to a real one. And it tells them once they've done that, then they're going to go to an EPIC web account request form. And it tells them exactly what they're going to plug in. They only have to do um, three, three or four fields, their first name, their last name, their role, which they're going to select other, and then type in research monitor. And that's what gets sent to EPIC to notify them, I'm creating an account for these people, but it's the restricted access account. So I know my first question when EPIC told me this was, what if I put physician? Who checks, right? They check. So every time they get this request, they look at the title. Even if this person had put physician, they still compare the role that the, the requester put to their title in the HR database. And as long as their title in the HR database says research monitor, the only template they can get is the restricted access one. So technically they wouldn't even have to do that. It's more just for epic purposes of knowing what the requests are for, right? But there, there's no way they can get another template aside from the restricted access if their title is research monitor in the HR database. So you can go ahead and send them this exact email, just plug in their net ID and temporary password, send it to them and they should know exactly what to do with it from there. All of that needs to get done before they get to campus. Okay. Um, so I mentioned already that the monitor no longer needs to sign the CO27 or the confidentiality agreement. Um, 
their request has been changed, and I don't know if you mentioned this already, the wording in the agreement covers the language that was originally in those other documents. Um, some benefits of the new restricted access template, which you're going to get to see in a second, they can no longer view patients that are not on their study, and they have no capabilities to add or edit anything in Epic. Not only do they have no capabilities to do that, which hopefully was happening before, because they hopefully had view-only rights, um, they won't even see any buttons that look like they could do something. So before, even if you have view only, it looks like you could add your own notes maybe, or there are buttons you could press that might do something, even though we all know, hopefully, that it didn't save, right? There's none of those buttons show up anymore. So literally, it doesn't even look like they could do something if they wanted to, okay? Um, another important point to hammer home is that um, you still need to notify, hopefully we were doing this before, but in case we weren't, when the soon as you know the dates that your monitor is coming to campus, you need to notify um, university compliance. I have this monitor, they're, this is their name, they're coming to campus these dates, because university compliance is still going to do the HIPAA audit check. So once your monitor comes, accesses the EPIC record, and leaves, compliance is still going to send the coordinator. Um, a statement to sign off and attest to that the monitor has not been anywhere that they're not supposed to be, that those are the charts they access, they had right to access those charts, they didn't go anywhere they shouldn't be, okay? So you're gonna wanna send that um, to Cindy Teeter, and Cindy, who else did you say? Angel could be on there too, <laughs> and Angel on there too. <laughs> And make sure as soon as you know those dates that you notify them every time they're coming. So this is not just for a first time monitor coming to campus. Anytime you have a monitor coming to campus who's going to, or an auditor who's going to be accessing those charts, you want to make sure you send them. Um, so if you're a big department and they, you have people who come a lot and you have a lot of monitors, right, like Hollings, they do an Excel spreadsheet that they send every week, I think with the list of their monitors um, that are coming and the dates that they're coming so that they know to prepare for that. Okay, anything you guys want to add to that? No, I really appreciate your uh, help in making us uh, compliant with the HIPAA regulations which say that we must audit who is accessing our medical records. And I don't see that, that requirement changing anytime soon. So if you have not been contacting our department, <coughs> And if you all, I'll have time for questions at the end, but if there's anything you want to ask as we go that you don't want to wait until the end to ask, go for it. I'm more than happy to answer it. So getting down to the technical side and the demo part, if I'm a coordinator, how much more or less work will this be for me? Hopefully less in the long run, but it's really easy once you um, learn how to do it, and learning how to do it takes approximately five minutes, so hopefully you'll get it as soon as you leave here, but if you have any questions throughout the process, feel free to give me a call. Um, so I'll walk you through it kind of verbally first, but then I'm going to show you. you. The study coordinator or study team member, PI, whoever is in charge of the monitor while they're there, <laughs> Um, is going to log into their own personal EPIC account. Okay? Not, a net ID, not the net ID that they saw from HR for their monitor, their own personal EPIC account, and create a list of patients um, that the monitor is going to want to see while they're there, and then share that list, specifically, or importantly, view only access to that list, which really will be your only option. You could try and click one of the other types of options, but it's not going to let you for the monitor net ID. So um, you're going to share that list view only with the research monitor. Um, and then when the research monitor gets to campus, when they pull up their EPIC, the only thing they're going to see are lists of patients that have been shared with them, nobody else, and no way to get to anybody else. Okay. The nice thing about this is you're going to want to set it up probably in advance to the monitor getting there. But it's real time. So if the monitor gets there and you forgot to put somebody on, or you've had a new patient role since you've created the list, you can just go ahead and add them. Um, if I know sometimes when I was a coordinator and I had a monitor that was there for multiple, that was on multiple studies, sometimes if he or she finished early with one study, they would say, well, let me see these two patients on this other study too. You can go ahead and add those to the list as well. These lists can stay up 
in Epic and shared with the monitor as long as you want them to. So you don't have to recreate the list every time they come. You can just leave it there and share it with them. They can't access it from off campus anyway. Um, but you can delete it if you want to, change it anytime, add or take off patients, however you want to do it. So I'm going to go ahead and demo from both sides so you can see what it's like. Let me mention this first because I'm going to show this in the demo too. So this um, allows monitors to access Epic from their own personal laptops. Um, they can sign on to a land computer as well with their own NetID and password and be restricted to certain places, but most of them are going to bring their own laptops. They do, if you have a um, wire internet in, in like a workstation, they can hook up with that. If not, they do have to access MUSC Secure, okay, which they can do, with their, that wireless network, which they can do with their NetID and password. It'll let them do it. The one issue, kind of technological issue we've run into so far with this, only I think with one or two coordinator or monitors who have come since we've implemented, is their security on their laptop has to be, their certificates have to be up to date. It seems like when a monitor is on a laptop with a security certificate expired, it's not letting them log on to MUSC Secure, and so we've had to find them landlines to connect to. So that is on their IT department. There's nothing really we can do um, to fix that. Okay, so if that's an error you encounter, <laughs> to test to make sure it's not their net ID that's not working, which it shouldn't be, but just to make sure, you can have them try and log into um, an Epic from a land computer, like your computer, open up Epic and have them log in and make sure their net ID and password work. But it, Typically, it's that their security certificates need to be updated, and only their IT department can do that. They can talk to our IT department and try and find out what certificates have to be updated, but... Okay, so, I'm going to go ahead and do the demo for the study team. Whoever's doing it on the study team, and I'm going to log into, hopefully I'll have Epic on my computer, but since I don't right here, I'm going to log into Epic through web apps with my net ID and password. So I'm going to log in, sorry for the delay, as myself. And I have my normal act, uh, Epic Access rights, so I see everything as it is. I'm going to go to this little icon here that is, I don't know if it helps you guys if I do this, but this is my patient list. You can also access it through the Epic drop-down menu. Um, right here, a patient list. So from there I just click edit list and create my list and I'm going to name it. So you can name it anything you want, um, like I know for Hollings it's probably a CTO number, for a, um, you can do a study number, you can do anything that the monitor is going to know what study that list is associated with just in case they're on multiple studies with multiple coordinators who are creating different lists for them. So I'll just name this one um, test one. And then you're going to want to um, click on what is displayed in the list. So when the monitor opens up Epic, they're going to have access to only those patients, but they're going to have access to that patient's entire chart, which they should, right? They need to make sure that if there's a shadow chart involved or um, just for data entry purposes that you haven't neglected to put something in, that might be an important adverse event. So they should have access to their entire chart. Um, but originally, when they first open the chart, they're going to see the list of patients and what you want them to see in that list before they click on it and open the entire chart. You can pick. You're kind of restricted um, to what they will actually be able to see. So there are some columns on here and some layouts that they wouldn't be able to see even if you clicked it just because of the type of access that they have. They'll be able to see it once they enter the chart, but they just won't be able to see it in list form. And it's probably just more annoying for you anyway. So patient name um, is probably one of them you're going to want. 
So you would just click on that and click add. So if you want to just not scroll through everything, you just click on available columns and start typing. MRN might be another one you want to add. So let's say those are the only two. Um, once you've done that, you're going to want to click over to the advanced tab. And this is the important part. This is where you enter the net ID of the monitor that you're sharing the list with. And for access level, you want to do view only. <coughs> so there's my monitor's net ID. I'm giving them view only access. I've included what columns I want to appear on the list when they first log in, and I hit accept. So now the list is created, and I want to add patients to it. So I click add patients, and you just search by name or MRN as you would any patient uh, that you're looking for in Epic. So I'm going to add some test patients on here just so you'll be able to see it. And that is all I have to do. My list is created, my list is shared. I can add patients at any time, delete patients at any time. Um, so I'm gonna log out of my account because my job is done. And typically, I would, in past demos, I log all the way out of even of web apps and log in as the monitor, but I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna lose Epic now that it's pulled up. So just know that from when a monitor arrives on campus, they'll select the MUSC wireless if that's what they're using, if they're not on, I'm sorry, MUSC Secure Wireless Network. Um, and they'll use their NetID and password to access that. Okay. Once they're there, they'll access web apps, and it's on this little instruction sheet that you've already sent them. From web apps, just like I did, they log on with their NetID and password. <laughs> the difference for my web apps versus the monitors is the only icons that are in their web apps with that NetID access is an Epic icon and I think maybe a cat's folder icon that they wouldn't really have access to anything in it. If I'm the monitor and I log on, if they've been here before, or for some of them, um, it's probably gonna self-populate, but if not, they're gonna select the medical records department, but that's gonna be the only option they have. So if it's a hard stop, if they hit that magnifying glass, that's the only department they'll be able to pick. They click OK. There's the list. This is all that they see when they first log in. So there's the list I created and shared with them. There's no way for them to get anywhere. There's no actions <coughs> under here. Um, the only thing under their Epic button is their logout, their exit, and to personalize their screen if they want to. Um, there's no other buttons. Their, rec I don't, their recent searches aren't going to have anything under there. But when they click on to a patient, they have an entire record for that patient. So they have their notes, their meds, their labs, everything. But you'll see that areas that usually have, that are live links, are not live links. There's nowhere for them to type anything. Nowhere for them to scroll to another patient or anywhere um, be able to do anything like that. This is all they can do. They can filter, but only through patients on their own list. They can't filter, it won't filter any other patients in Epic. Um, that is all, they can search, but they can only search patients on this list, <coughs> nothing else will come up. But if they have a big long list of a huge study, right, like a chart review or something, they can um, type it in if they want to get to the patient faster. So that is all they see. So there's really no training. I did put together a screenshot training document for them if they wanted to, of clicking on the magnifying glass to check medical records uh, department and then hitting log on. But, and then it has a screenshot of what their epic chart will look like. But there's really nothing else to kind of instruct them on from that point of view. If I log off as them and log back in as myself, 
when I want to get rid of those lists, I, here's how I could delete. I can just remove patients by right clicking. Um, or I can remove a whole list by delete my list. And you'll see the patients will show up in here for a second, but once it's refreshed, those patients will be gone too. Oops. Um, additional notes and future plans. So I mentioned before, currently this process is only for on-site visits. Um, there is a way to adapt it and allow VPN and be able to do remote monitoring once that process has been um, kind of flushed out and all the security precautions are in place. Um, you can access all the policy, the entire policy and all of the forms on the MUSC HR page. Um, and you can contact the Success Center obviously with any questions. One other additional component I forgot to mention, um, which will kind of help for new um, sponsor relationships we have and also helps to kind of cover us from this new agreement standpoint is before there wasn't really in the clinical trial agreement that a sponsor signs with MUSC it says they're allowed access to the medical records and that's kind of where we were running um, into some issues is that sponsors were saying well I I didn't know I was gonna have to do a background check you said I can have access to these records you need to give them to me and we were kind of feeling you know some pressure from that and having to do all the shadow charts and, or do an over the shoulder type of thing. Um, now all of the new contracts have language in them. Um, Darren and um, Cindy in ORSP have included language in the new contracts that say there is the potential for you to have access to medical records. Here's our policy. Here's the steps you're going to go through to get access to those records so that they know in advance up front is really transparent what that's going to involve and so that they're going to be able to read and review that before they sign their clinical trial agreement. So any questions, concerns, comments? We are meeting as the group who put this together, as I mentioned, it's under Dr. Flume and Dr. Crossan and Dr. Warren um, and Mitch Plyler played a huge part in developing, they really did it all on their own, developing the restricted access template. But the meetings to put together the policy were compliance and ORSP and legal and HR and identity management and everybody from everywhere to kind of make sure this came together in a way that satisfied everybody's requirements and regulations and make sure everything was considered. We're hoping to get that group together um, again once this has been rolled out for a little bit and go over some of the feedback we've been getting um, from monitors and coordinators already. So any feedback you have when you go to implement this, um, any problems you run into, please send them to me. Call, you can call me so I can try and resolve them um, while your monitor's there. But also please send them to me over email and descriptions of anything um, that you want kind of thought through and reviewed when we get back together as a group and make sure that everything's going well and in place the way it should be. If there's no questions or concerns, I am all done. Thank you all for coming.